Good afternoon. My internet connection is unstable. <laughs> so it's on the slide. So thank you all for coming. The greatest danger is not that we aim too high and we miss it, but that it's too low and we reach it. That's a quote from Michelangelo from centuries ago that I think is, is applicable to us today as it has been at any other time in history. And so with that backdrop in your mind, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, where we are, but more importantly, where I'd like us to go as a College of Engineering at Penn State. Um, first, I want to thank um, all of you who are here and who are watching uh, through the live stream for coming and taking the time to listen today. Um, I also want to thank um, essentially all of you. I've now visited um, every department and just about every program um, in order to get to know uh, who you are and what you're doing. And, uh, I've greatly appreciated the, the warmth and welcoming environments I've found in, in every visit. Um, you know, I would say that it's, it's, it's added inspiration to, uh, to my view of, of where to take this college um, and certainly more than reaffirmed um, my sense that this is a, a truly great place um, to be, to work, and to uh, push the limits of, of our own capabilities and, and our own visions for, for how we impact the world. Um, so today I really want to continue this discussion for a vision. Um, I want you to, if you're live streaming, I know you can ask questions at any time and uh, Dana will ask them uh, at the end, she'll read them out. Um, and if in the audience you have questions that you feel are, are compelling enough to stop me in my tracks, feel free. Um, it'll give me a chance to take a drink of water and, uh, and hear from you. Um, and first, before I go on, let me also thank Dana and Kate and Lynn um, and others for contributions to the PowerPoint that I'm going to show, both uh, content and aesthetics. So um, thank you all for the help. So I'm going to start, if my, I may be stuck on this. There we go. So I had a version of this in my interview talk without the student numbers on it. Um, but I feel it as much today as then that the flagship College of Engineering in the sixth biggest state in the country should be perennially top five. And we have now approaching 10,000 total students at University Park. Um, and if I include, uh, as all of you doing advising, uh, do in your minds the ones who are at the other campuses but are planning to come here within the year or two, that number closes in on about 12,000. Um, so those students, I would say, are both um, our unfair competitive advantage. There is some benefit uh, and, and strength to be um, taken from being big and strong. Um, but as all of you well know, the, the size that we've grown to is also um, one of our biggest challenges. And so that will come out um, in the talk today. And let me just also add, I'll say a little bit more about rankings as we go. Um, I don't think we focus on rankings for their own sake. Um, I think they're informative and, and help uh, give us some feedback on, on how we're doing in, in certain ways. Um, and we also do know that they are impactful uh, in terms of, of helping us accomplish the things that we're trying to accomplish. Um, I also want to say that we, we need to start um, by thinking about where we are and how we define ourselves. Uh, and I think groups should first define themselves by their culture and their values. Um, I think we have um, excellent uh, values in this college and at this university. Um, I'm reminded of Peter Drucker's, uh, who's a famous um, leader from the management, um, the intellectual side of the, of the management community from 40, 50 years ago, um, that culture eats strategy for breakfast, meaning um, that no matter what you plan to do and, 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 and perceive that you should be doing, if you don't have the right culture behind it and the right values behind it, you know, all your plans will, will, will not succeed simply because you lack the right culture to back it. And so, um, I think of the cultures that we have and we should aspire to, and I've listed some here, and I would argue that we're at various stages for each. Um, so starting off with, with excellence, this college has a 121-year uh, history of excellence uh, in technology and engineering. Um, that is world-renowned, and it is a strong brand across the country and across the world. Um, I'm going to talk more about societal impact as we go on. Um, and I think one thing that we learned from the climate study um, that was done recently is that uh, while we have some strength in our relationship culture, we also have some work to do 
uh, in terms of the, the levels of collegiality and inclusiveness that we have. And so that's another topic we'll talk about. And I want us to translate that into a culture of what I would call leadership in equity and inclusion and turn something that's been perhaps a challenge in the past uh, into one of our core strengths. Uh, a culture of integrity and transparency. Um, I get the a feeling of a, of a very strong um, core integrity uh, within this college. I think um, people would all describe themselves and their peers as having a great deal of integrity. Um, I can't speak to past transparency because I wasn't here. Um, but I will say that I have a commitment to having strong transparency to go with that. Um, empowerment and entrepreneurship um, in some ways go hand in hand. I think we have a strong and growing entrepreneurial climate. Um, and I think we have a, a fairly strong uh, climate of empowerment um, within the context that we heard, at least in terms of the climate study. So there are certainly some groups who feel that they are empowered, but I think there are other groups that feel um, like they are not. And as we evolve the climate, um, I look to, to really enhance this feeling of, of empowerment among all the faculty, staff, and students. All right. So where are we? Um, looking back for, for the last decade, these are what I would call the decadal changes. Um, I think all of you are very well aware that the undergraduate student population has grown uh, not just a little bit, but by actually 43%. Um, that 43% growth is actually a, a larger number of students than some of our peers. Um, have in total, right? So our increase in student population is greater than other people's total student population, um, which is in a sense like saying we started a whole other school and just added in into our college. Um, so it's an impressive number, um, both in terms of its, its scale, but also its impact on us both positively and negatively. Um, with that, our grad student populations increased by only 7%, um, which is actually less than the tenure tenure track faculty increase of 10%. Right? So the implication there is that um, perhaps the growth in the undergraduate population is slowing our ability to also grow the graduate programs. Um, but then there's also a piece of that, though, that the um, lagging growth of the grad students relative to faculty um, in that our faculty is, well, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to talk about age, so I'll say much less experienced perhaps than it was 10 years ago. We have a very strong youth movement going on in the faculty um, that started a few years ago that is, um, I think, driving many things forward in a positive direction. And if we, if we succeed in all of this year's searches, um, then that actual total number of tenure track, uh, tenure, tenure track um, is actually an increase in 18%. So we have a lot going on uh, in that department as well. The thing that surprised me the most, I think, of all these numbers is that as our undergraduate increased by 43%, the number of teaching faculty uh, in the college over the last 10 years has actually decreased by three. Um, you know, that's, I suspect that's more of a department-to-department -department, uh, decision than, than something that was college-wide, but I will say that it did take me by surprise. Um, the rankings, people ask me about the rankings with some regularity. I think most people are referring to the U.S. News and World Report rankings. Um, our graduate program for the college has gone uh, down from 23 to 32. Most of that drop is really in the last two or three years. Um, the undergraduate college ranking overall has gone from 19 to 20, and that's really been more oscillatory uh, the last few years. A change of, of one or two um, is generally noise. And if you only look at the public schools rather than the, all of the schools in the US, that 32 becomes a 19 and the undergrad becomes a 10. Unfortunately, even in the last few years as the, the college grad ranking has dropped, the departments have actually um, sustained or actually even moved up in their rankings, which is, which is certainly a very good thing. I actually prefer, if, if one is going to look at rankings, the Times Higher Ed rankings, which just came out recently, um, which takes, I think, a little bit more of a, a deeper dive into meaningful numbers. I'll talk about more about them. So they only publish us in terms of um, rankings in the world, and then you have to pull out the, uh, the US numbers. Um, so in that case, we're in this year at 54, um, which is slightly down from last year. Um, I'll show that number in a minute. In the US, we're actually moved up to 22. Um, and that's 12 in, in among public schools. So for those who aren't familiar with the Times Higher Ed Rankings, this is a chart um, from their website that shows how they, uh, the different parameters and the different percentage weightings they do for all the different categories. They actually take data from over 500 universities across 50 different countries. Um, they have all of their data um, verified by a private accounting firm um, rather than just uh, relying on trust. Um, which is in comparison to U.S. News and World Report, who a few years ago 
um, republished all of their rankings one year as being new when, all they, when they'd actually made a mistake in their data collection. And so they republished their previous year's data again the following year and pretended it was new until someone called them out and they, and they admitted what had happened. So um, Times Higher Ed has not had this problem. Um, in fact, if you look at different programs, you'll see years missing here and there in terms of a score. So if they have a problem with their data collection or, or don't trust their information, they actually don't even include it. Um, but what you see from this is that it's about 33% is reputation. Um, so there's 15% uh, for reputation related to teaching, 18% um, which is reputation related to research. And then the rest of the ranking, the 30% total that's for teaching, is really derived from primarily from uh, ratios of grad students to undergrad students and then for the different categories of students relative to the number of faculty. On the research side, there's the, there's the um, survey reputation piece and then there's income um, and also research productivity. And the thing that makes this different, particularly from US News and World Report, is that 30% of the scores is solely based on citations. Um, so a, a much more uh, quantitative um, external measure um, than these other things which are, are much more humanly derived. Um, it's also the only ranking I've seen that looks and factors in um, your international perspective and interactions, um, and also has a small piece, 2.5% um, for tech transfer um, through industry income. So looking at these numbers a bit, first just doing this comparison of how it is we're 32 in US News and World Report and 22nd in Times Higher Ed, who do we pass? It's always good to know who you pass um, by the other ranking. And so by, by focusing on that system, we do find that the more quantitative metrics puts us ahead of Virginia Tech, Minnesota, Texas A&M, NC State, UCLA, UC Boulder, Maryland, and also even some surprising privates, Duke, Harvard, and Penn. Um, and if you look at who we fall behind when you go from one to the other, well, the answer is also quite pleasant. We don't fall behind anybody. <laughs> so let's look a little bit deeper at, at what the Times Higher Ed saw in terms of our performance metrics. Um, so these are their scores that they, they calculate using those different weightings within each category. Um, and you can see the 82.8 is our citation. So we do, you know, when you just look at what we produce and how it's impacting research around the world, our citations show that we are actually extremely strong. That's our highest number. Um, I haven't been, it's, it, it's hard to dig into their, their data. They don't provide it in a way that's easy to sort. I would love to know where we stand ranking wise just from the citation merit, but I suspect it's probably in the, in the top 10 for um, US at least, if not higher. Um, so this, is, this plot shows our overall score, and these numbers are the ranking in the world for that year. So one thing to note, there's, everybody has a bit of a, a jump or change in their scores from 2015 to 2016 because they updated their methodology. So um, you can't really compare the, these absolute values crossing from 15 to 16. You'll also see that just in the last two years, our score stayed the same, but our ranking fell in the world, right? That means others did, did better and moved up from, from other countries. At the same time, like I said, we passed other countries in the, or other schools in the US um, in that time. And so, you know, there's a lot of movement because it is very data driven. So we can also look at um, each of these different categories over this uh, seven year period. You'll notice 2013 is missing. Um, for somehow they didn't, ca they didn't capture us that year. So this data is, is I find very interesting. This is our citation number. Um, the score has been you know, high for three straight years since they changed the metric, um, which in many ways is actually a very positive trend for us. So if we go through a period right, where we have um, voluntary retirement and a loss of many senior faculty replaced by younger junior faculty, you would expect a drop in citations. Right? Simply because to accrue citations, there's a, there's a time lag between when you publish, when the citations publish, and that, that citation propagates. So the fact that our citation rate stayed flat, even through this transition to younger faculty, really bodes well for the future. Right? So I would call this data that has, that's, that's um, it's purely data, not, not opinion, um, but it does have a bias for senior faculty simply because of the time lag for for citation. And you can see this actually maintains its score even when we had this bit of a drop. So where did this drop come from? Right, a little bit came from the, the research. And um, I, oh, these numbers are so new that I don't know whether this little bit of a drop in the research is 
um, the research dollars. We did have a change in our reporting, which affected that. Um, and then there's also the reputation score uh, that folds into this. So remember, 60% of research is 30% is reputation. The other 40% is um, performance. Right? And as a nice important note to go with that, um, looking through, I guess, about last week's data for new research awards, we are running about 38% ahead of last year. So um, to everyone who's writing proposals and staff who are supporting proposal writing, proposal submission, um, and those of you who are going to soon be doing post-award on 38% more work, um, thank you and congratulations for, for what you've accomplished so far this year. Um, and we look forward to talking about 30 40% increases every year hereafter. Um, but nice job, everyone, truly. That's a 38% a increase in new research awards in a situation where, at best, Washington's funding is flat and is really declining, um, really speaks well to, to the quality of the faculty and the staff who are, who are making this happen. A few more metrics, the industry income. Um, we're, we're starting to focus on that just in the last year or so. Um, these last two years have been flat. We would hope to see that rise. Um, the international outlook, we know we're putting more and more effort uh, into growing our international programs and collaborations, and that's on the rise. The interesting one here, of course, is the teaching. And if you remember, the teaching is 30%. 18 of that 30 is reputation. 12% of it is basically a combination of different student-to-faculty student -faculty ratios and PhD to bachelor's degree ratios. And we know that's where we're getting hit hardest with this large growth in undergraduate populations. And so um, the fact that our score, overall score has been able to uh, stay strong, even as we've had this drop in that 30%, um, speaks to how well we're doing in other things, and also does help to inform uh, what we need to focus on, on moving forward. And so in that context, I like to refer back to Plato. You'll see I like quotes. Um, you get used to that after a while, I hope. Um, but Plato said, a good decision is based on knowledge and not numbers. Um, in engineering, of course, we rely on numbers quite a bit. Um, and I think the key message here um, is that we use numbers to create knowledge, right? And we have to extract the meaning from them. So this is the, the thousands of years ago way of saying what we now call um, what lies, damn lies, and statistics. Um, I think Plato was a little more eloquent, so I go with his quote. Um, so where does this take us going forward, right? How do we be informed from those numbers and be informed from who we, who we want to be, what we value, what we want our culture to be, and think about where we go next? Um, so I'm going to talk about four different topics. Um, some of them are more internally focused, some are more externally focused. Um, hopefully, in the end, you'll see that there's alignment of all four of them in one direction. We don't have four arrows pointing in four different directions. Because um, if you pull on that equally, then you go nowhere. Um, so engineering humanity, I'll talk quite a bit about. Um, and then a focus on research and graduate education, um, which go hand in hand and will hopefully help us address uh, the, some of our student ratios. Um, diversity, inclusion, and climate is um, a theme that you've already heard me talk about. Um, if you've met me in any of our other settings, and you'll continue to hear about it um, until the problem is solved, which is probably quite a long time. Um, and lastly, if there's any rallying cry that unites everyone in engineering here at Penn State, <laughs> it's our beautiful buildings and infrastructure. And while I do have a great deal of respect um, for old classic traditions, um, I don't think this is an area where we want to maintain uh, too much respect for that. Um, I will say, many of you have heard me say this before, but um, you know, there's one great thing about having an office in Hammond, right? It's that you can't see Hammond. <laughs> so, so let me start with the, the engineering humanity. And this goes to um, what I think is the core of what is engineering uh, as a discipline, as a, as a driving force in, in human history. So the impact, you know, what is engineering? Engineering is the translation of known science right, to the application for the, better, for the benefit of humanity. Right, so impact of hum on humanity has been the story of engineering for at least a, a thousand years, if not longer. Right, and so if you think about what's the, you know, the biggest difference between our lives today and, and that of people a thousand years ago, um, it's the fact that a thousand years ago our drinking water and our wastewater was the same stream. Right, and the impact of that on human health was um, horrendous, as you can imagine. 
Um, we still do have clean water problems in parts of the world um, and in a couple parts of the United States, unfortunately. Right? But for the most part, right, we can walk to the back of the room, if you're thirsty, feel free, right, and get a clean glass of water um, to drink. But every one of our disciplines can focus on a long list of areas where they really transformed human life right, for the better, whether it be um, water, food, transportation, medicine, communications, et cetera. It's, it's, um, it's something that all of our disciplines can, can brag about. And I would argue that past is prologue, and you know, impact on humanity must be the engineering story for the next millennium also. And I think those of us who think deep down about what brought us into um, our disciplines, you know, the, the having an impact is, is often very much what it's all about. So given that, I think there's also been a lack um, of discussion of engineering in this context, um, at least throughout my life, right, the last 50 years. So um, when I was in high school a couple of years ago, um, maybe a few more than a couple of years ago, um, my physics teacher often talked about a book by C.P. Snow called Two Cultures, which talked back then about the growing divide between the technical and science communities and, and the non-STEM communities, and how this was a problem talked about even then. And I think compared today to what I'll say was over 30 years ago, right, that divide has grown even bigger. And in STEM, we do point out that, well, if we had stronger K-12 education and more science and more STEM in K-12, the divide would be smaller. And that's true, and I completely agree with that. But I think we also need to take pause and think about our own role in closing that divide and how we think about engineering and present it in terms of integrating with, with the rest of society and the rest of culture. Um, and so that my, my push is that here at Penn State, we need to take that leadership mantle within the engineering community and make engineering humanity you know, our story. And I give a world of credit to Dana for the tagline, right? Engineering humanity, it's why we are. And so um, that's a phrase, and, and the, the engineering humanity theme is something we're going to be, be talking about a lot over the next few years. Um, there is some pieces of this um, in recent history not phrased in that context, right? But almost 10 years ago, the National Academy did talk about um, the grand challenges for engineering. I think the underpinning of this was to talk about engineering impacting humanity, though in, in some of the examples that they give, they still focus more on the technological impact rather than the human impact. And so when I talk about engineering humanity and having that impact, it's not that we're necessarily changing what we're doing from a technical perspective, right? It's changing the way we, we help people to perceive what we do and, and relate what we do to how it impacts everybody else. Right? Now, more recently, the UN um, in 2015 put together their sustainable development goals, right? So this was not targeted for the engineering community like the NAE was, right? It was targeted to the world in terms of saying, you know, we want a sustainable planet for you know, thousands of years to come. These are the challenges we face, and they identified 17. But I think if you look at any one of these 17, there is a engineering underpinning to the solution, right? Now, they'll have pieces of the solution that aren't engineering. And in fact, in many of the cases, it's going to be that marriage between the science, the engineering, and the rest of society working together to actually have the impact to make the change that's needed. And so when we talk about engineering humanity, we're talking about how do we not just have technical excellence, but how do we integrate ourselves in with the rest of the world to really make these changes. So bringing this concept home, um, what are our goals, right? We lead the engine, is for Penn State to lead the engineering community going forward, um, to redefine multidisciplinary by engaging across campus, right? And to engage globally to solve societal problems, right? Now I think from goals to tactics, right? We need to really continue to expand so many activities that we're already doing. I think almost every department, every faculty can say, yes, this is already what we're doing, it's what we're all about, and that really is the point. Um, and we're gonna now establish a humanity-focused brand for the college, and therefore to contextualize our technological um, innovations. And so um, one example that's new, we have this growing partnership with Peru. Um, so two, just about two and a half years ago, we had 10 students um, that studied in Peru through an Engineering Pathways Fellows Initiative. Um, those underrepresented students are now still showing 100% retention and approaching the 100% graduation. And so this is an example of where we take what we're doing, we have impact abroad, and then we have impact back home as well. 
And right now we're collecting uh, applications to send as many as 30 or so um, to Peru this coming summer. Another great example of what we're already doing um, with our students is, of course, HESI, the Humanitarian Engineering and Social Entrepreneurship Program, um, which I describe to people as being a marriage of the Peace Corps with Wall Street. Um, so we're teaching our students to not just have that technological impact that they want to have um, on the world, but also uh, in a way that allows them um, to do something that will be sustainable. So they teach them the business side of the social entrepreneurship to go with uh, the human impact. Um, at the faculty level, right, as I said, just about everybody in our faculty can talk about their research in this context, but we're looking to also expand our interactions on campus, and so we've begun discussions with the School of Law and the um, School of International Affairs for what we're calling a law policy uh, and engineering initiative. So I list about 15, 14 or 16 topics here. Um, the plan is not to launch all 16 of these topics at once. Right? The idea here was that there was a law policy energy initiative that started before I got here. And I started thinking, well, what comes next? Right? What's after we succeed with energy? And it was very easy to make this very long list in a very short period of time. And so the idea is that we're going to um, energize our engineering faculty to think about how do they want to necessarily engage um, with a law community or a policy community or a regulatory community to do something extra with what they do to see it get implemented uh, in a faster way. Often we find in, in engineering that the things that we do, we achieve our technological goals and then there's this delay before they have real impact, right? Because laws, you know, updating law is always behind updating science and engineering and updating policy is always lagging. And so we've started the conversation about both um, possible, possible educational partnerships for undergraduate and graduate students um, and also how we're going to try to instill um, opportunities that are funded for faculty um, to reach over to the, the School of Law and International Affairs and look at ways of, of partnering on, on new things. Okay. Um, now, also started working with Dana on a new branding campaign, right? So we're going to be launching a brand of engineering humanity, right, with our standard defining, standard, standard defining elements, excellence, innovation, impact, inclusiveness, so the same themes collaboration, societal engagement, entrepreneurship, and diversity. These will be woven into, our, our cultures will then be woven into our engineering humanity brand. And for those of you that wonder whether we really need branding, this is actually from the Chronicles of Higher Ed from last week. Um, you know, in, a, in an era where all the wonderful information technologies developed by engineers in the last 20 years are impacting the way everybody lives and thinks, um, we have to stay in front uh, in terms of branding. If we don't brand ourselves, we'll either be forgotten or worse yet, we'll be branded by others, right? And so we're going to take the initiative uh, and brand ourselves before it's done for us. So in the next couple months, Dana and her team will be developing what she calls a river of content. Um, this will be original content that needs to represent all of our departments, all of our programs, capture as many of the wide variety of things that we're doing. That's her challenge because we're doing a lot. Um, in all sorts of different media forms, video, research stories, profiles of faculty, staff, students, alumni, photos, info, I don't even know what infographic is, she wrote that word, she can tell me later. Um, we're going to engage students in this process so we know that, our audi that we can reach audiences of all ages. Um, I love the way she talks about how we'll distribute it, she's calling it a surround sound approach. Um, multi-channel distribution to reach broad stakeholders in their environments. So we have so many different stakeholders in so many different professions at so many different stages of life and who we reach and interact with for so many different reasons. Right? We're talking about middle and high school students who we're trying to excite about having an impactful life through engineering to an alum from the 50s right, who we're hoping to help us do that by, through development and support. And we need to reach them through different mechanisms. Um, and we'll be leveraging our internal and external channels to really share all of our impact stories. Right? And the important message here is that everyone has a role in this, to play in this. Right? We need you to share your successes. We need you all to share your human impact stories with communications. These takes on many forms, awards and honors, grants, publications, milestones, outreach and service, collaborations, et cetera. The, the numbers, the, the examples go on and on. So let me now transition to research in grad ed, getting a little more back to home. You know, we saw the numbers for our undergrad to grad ratio and the, the relatively slow growth of our PhD programs. 
we need to significantly increase this growth. And here's a, here's a graph that you've seen. I'm focusing here on the US News and World Report because we have more data, right? So these are the undergrad rankings. This is that grad ranking drop. This is the undergrad to grad ratio, right? And this is the undergrad to PhD ratio. And for some comparison, our undergrad to grad ratio, which is the number that I look at the most, has increased from 4.23 to 5.51 in the last 10 years. Oops. Um, give you a comparison, Ohio State is right at 4.2 now, so they're where we used to be. And in both ranking systems, they are one notch above us, right? And so we need to fix that. Um, and then Illinois, UI, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, um, which has been a top five uh, you know, engineering school my entire life um, and is always one of the top two or three state schools, their undergrad to grad ratio is under three. And they're in a state that has even worse state financial situation than Pennsylvania has right now. Um, so so that's, where we're, that's who we're competing against. Right? There is some good news. Right? This year's first year students, um, we have 1,812. Uh, that was 18. 30, I think it was, but uh, I think, unfortunately, a few haven't quite made it. Um, oh, thank you. In last year at this time, that number was around 2,100. There was some intention to that um, from admissions. Hopefully, there'll be some continuity with that. And I'll also say that, also say that um, Peter Butler's working hard uh, with others on campus to, to really reassess the entrance to major processes. And so that discussion is ongoing, and, and you know, hopefully we'll see... Um, something that's more favorable to us down the road with that as well. So what should our goals be? Research in grad ed is, is big. And one of the reasons I focus more on the undergrad to grad ratio than the ratio to faculty numbers is that growing the graduate program is, is more complex because you not only need to recruit more students, you need funding for the students, you need offices for the students, research labs for the students, and of course faculty to advise the students. And so you can't solve the graduate, you can't grow the PhD program by just addressing one topic. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to smartly grow our research portfolio with, I think, as a focus on larger grants, large engineering centers. Um, we'll not increase our PhD program by 50% only with single investigator grants. We don't stop doing those, but we need to work more collectively across departments and across campus um, to bring in centers. We need to fix the undergrad-grad ratio by adjusting both sides of the equation, the number of undergrads and the number of grads. Um, we have some complex issues related to growing the PhD programs, like I said, um, and we need to increase the level of operational support. We have um, many faculty working hard to get many proposals done. We have staff working way too hard to try to help them get them done. We are understaffed. I think after buildings and infrastructure, we could probably all agree that we are um, unfortunately understaffed right now, and our staff are um, working as hard as they can every day um, to meet the demands of our faculty who are working hard every day to maintain world leadership. And so we know there's a need for, for improved operational support. Some tactics, uh, junior faculty mentoring, we've talked about this youth movement. We need to make sure that those investments are maximized. Um, we have uh, 12 units with junior faculty and the um, all are trying mentoring at, at different levels and with, with different degrees of success. So I think we have a bit of heterogeneity there and we're starting to talk about um, how we can improve that across the board. Um, we need to improve our, our contracts and grants processes to, to optimize proposal submissions without, uh, without putting our staff under undue pressure. Um, and we need stronger collaborative relationships with the Commonwealth campuses. So one of the very different things about Penn State from anywhere else I've ever been or seen is that we are one university with 24 campuses as opposed to, for example, North Carolina that simply has 17 universities in one system. And so there is no crosstalk between universities within the system at most big states, whereas here, you know, admissions is done by one for all. And so um, I think there's, there's room to um, see mutual benefit for both us, for some of the Commonwealth campuses, and frankly for some of our undergraduates by working more closely with those campuses um, and coordinating to ensure um, that the right students are in the right place um, for their best performance um, and that the program quality is, is uniform regardless of where people are. Uh, on the research side, and you can see I've, I've mixed my tactics together between the student side and the research side of this equation. Um, Chris has expanded the, the engine grants to um, allow non-tenure track faculty and postdocs to also apply, and I'm hoping um, that he'll be complaining about being overwhelmed with the number of submissions this year. The window's open, I think, for about another month. 
Um, so please, when we're done here, feel free to go write a proposal. Um, and we're, we're also have expanded the multidisciplinary seed grants um, to encourage faculty to not just work multidisciplinary within the college, but to really reach across college boundaries uh, and work with our good friends around campus. More tactics, there's a lot of them for this. Um, we're starting to collaborate with the Vice President for Research and some of the institutes um, to initiate uh, what we call Engineering Research Center proposal development um, with some funding behind it. So Chris is working on a plan for um, a workshop to introduce the ERC program to faculty who might be interested. Um, also update them because the National Academy just uh, issued a report advising the NSF on how to change the program. That report's a real opportunity for us because if they do change the program, everybody's coming into a new program at the same time. And frankly, it's also going to delay the solicitation, which gives us time to start building our teams now. Winning ERC proposals don't start the day the solicitation comes out. They start months and months ahead. So after this workshop, um, we're going to be putting out a call for proposals from teams of, of faculty um, to really help fund them to start building um, world-class competitive proposals. To give you a sense of the scale, we already have $300,000 set aside for this, um, and Chris is working on, on talking to other institutes to expand that even further. Um, leadership development for associate and full professors. You know, we do focus on mentoring the junior faculty. We're going to work on improving that. But all too often, once someone gets tenure and is promoted to associate, you know, we congratulate them and we sort of send them off on their way to do their own thing. Um, that's actually a critical point at which it's time to, to continue to develop faculty skill sets towards leadership so that not only are we talking about our ERC this year, you know, but I, when I talked to the provost about buildings and infrastructure, I told him, you know, seven years from now, when we get our second ERC, we're going to need a place to house it, right? If we're going to start getting ERCs regularly, and keep in mind, there have been, I think, 70 of them issued in the history of the NSF. We've never led one, right? Which, if you think about our, our history of excellence, our reputation, and our broad strength, um, you know, there's something wrong there, and we need to address that, and we're going to. And so leadership training for our, young, our up and coming rising star faculty so they learn how to do not just ERCs and NSF STCs and centers, but really across the spectrum of, of Murray's from DOD and the large programs that come out of all the different agencies. We're also focusing on endowment growth. We need ways to support first year grad students without research grants. We need ways to attract um, the very, very best students. We get a lot of them, but we should be getting more of them. Um, and endowment for both grad student support and faculty support um, is, is part of that. And getting back to branding, you know, telling our stories publicly and loudly is important. I know um, a number of faculty who have hidden tag counters on their, their own group website. And so they've known when their career award panelists were meeting because they saw a sharp rise in the hits on their site. So even though panelists aren't supposed to do that, I suspect many of them do, right? They're all sitting with their laptops open. So our marketing, our stories have to be out there. They have to be public and visible and up to date. Um, we also have something, to, a job to do in the dean's office. So as you all know, for about uh, the past year, George has been um, working hard as a um, 0.5 FTE, so 60 hours a week, um, as the associate dean for research. Um, I will say this is the only place I've been um, in my career where one associate dean has been over, un, over all of academics, undergrad, masters, and PhD. So um, Peter Butler's been doing that. I've actually talked about changing his title, the Associate Dean of Impossible Tasks, um, and we're working on that. There's no HR classification for that. That's the, the only challenge. Um, so we realize that we need um, Peter to focus more on our undergraduate programs and more on our graduate programs, and somehow you know, he decided he did want to go home at night still um, on occasion. And so we've decided to um, expand George's responsibilities. Um, so George will become full-time Associate Dean as soon as we get the, the process through. Um, so thank you, George, for taking that on. We really do appreciate it. Um, right now, it's loosely called in graduate programs. We're fine-tuning the title. Um, the thought process is to actually leave the um, non-research uh, one-year masters with Peter, because those align more with undergraduate education. And, and the boundary will be then any graduate program that has a research component um, you know, will have George's support. And so you know, I've, the last line is the most important, the ellipses. Um, but we're looking for George to provide leadership and focus in matters where the college role is impactful. So recruiting, fellowships, um, professional development experiences that, that 
um, are non-disciplinary, right? So we're not talking about getting engaged in um, tampering or tinkering with the department academic graduate programs, right? This is the everything else that goes with it to, to enhance our recruiting and to enhance uh, the experience of our students um, and also possibly our, our postdocs. So the third topic, um, diversity, inclusion, and climate. Right, our undergraduate enrollment uh, this fall is 8,306, plus or minus, depending on how you count and who you count and when you count. Um, right now, that's 22% female, which is roughly on par with the national average for engineering, uh, and 11% underrepresented minorities, which is roughly uh, behind the national average for engineering. Um, this is something that we're, we need to work on, and we've begun talking about how to do it um, with a very, very aggressive goal, and approach. So the goal is very simply, if you haven't heard, um, is gender equity in the undergraduate program within six years. Right? So 22% to 50% um, beginning with the class that will arrive here two years from now. Um, increased diversity across all categories at the same time. Um, and in the end, the goal is to be the leader in diversity, inclusion, and climate amongst all large state colleges of engineering in the country. So I will say that Carnegie Mellon's right now about 43% female. Columbia is at 49%, MIT is around 50%, right? But they're small. I don't know if their combined undergraduate program is as big as ours. They're private, um, and frankly, they're rich, and, and that is a factor. Um, so if you look at our, our history um, for, for gender and in, in the pr proportion of women in the undergraduate program, you know, we've had some growth, right, from 16 to 22% over the last 10 years. Um, that makes us number nine in the number of degrees awarded, um, but we're not number nine in the total number of engineering degrees awarded, right? We're much higher than that because of our size. And I would say slow and steady does not win the race. Um, this is a recent quote I saw from a NASA scientist, Florence Tan, um, who's actually quoting the World Economic Formula, Forum, right? Women right now earn about a third of the undergraduate STEM degrees in the country. And that includes, when we say STEM, that includes the biological sciences uh, as well but they're actually earning 60% of our college degrees, right? By 2024, there'll be about a million engineering and computer science jobs, and in the U.S., we simply don't have enough people to do this work. We need women to join the engineering um, and STEM workforce. This is a national good, according to her. So I'd like to set the goal. 50-50 is a good number um, percentage-wise, and to quantify it, we're talking at least 1,000 women per year coming out of Penn State with bachelor's degrees in engineering. Right. So what's our target then distribution, um, undergrad and grad, right? On the order of 4,000 male, 4,000 female, um, and 2,500 graduate. And that hopefully that graduate population also takes on the, the specter of, of having gender equity as well. In terms of underrepresented minorities, right? We've also seen some growth from about 5% 10 years ago to 11%. And this is the percentage of our domestic students, not the percentage of all of our students. Um, this is also too low and we're gonna to look to see if we can double those numbers too. So how do we do it? This is the one where you're all saying, well, what's the tactics, right? It's easy to say the goal. Um, the reason I gave Peter the, the, the title of Associate Dean of Impossible Tasks is, is partially this, and so he's been spending, he and Jennifer both have been spending a lot of time thinking through how we address this. Um, and if you think about it, there's four steps to the process, right? There's getting young women to apply to engineering at Penn State, there's admitting them to engineering at Penn State. There's getting them to come after they've been admitted, right? And then there's helping them graduate, right, while they're here. Now, of course, we could increase the number by keeping them and not graduating, but that's really not the spirit of the intent. One of the associate deans, I won't name names, said, why don't we just fail all the men? Um, we've decided, we voted three to two against it, so we're not gonna do that. Um, so what are we gonna do, right? So we're going to look, like we said, at every step of the way. The two places to start, um, I think are the admissions, but also um, recruiting the ones who have been admitted to engineering to come here. So if you look at this year's freshman data, which Jennifer has done, um, of all the male students admitted to Penn State Engineering for this fall, 33% are here. Of all the female students admitted to engineering at Penn State for this fall, only 25% are here. So if we just had the same admission, or the same acceptance of our offers rate for the women and men, we would go from 22 to 30 percent overnight, right? Now we're looking at why they don't come. Part of it came out from the climate study, right? Part of it is um, 
how do we present Penn State engineering and are we presenting this idea of impact in humanity? And part of it, probably the number one factor that we got on the, the, the university got for responses of why they're not coming was scholarship. We are the most expensive state school or the least expensive private school, depending how you want to look at it. Either way, scholarships matter. And so, you know, if Carnegie Mellon and Columbia and MIT have more scholarship money and can, you know, give money to the, the very best, they're going to do it. And so one of our big goals in the development campaign is going to be scholarship funds um, to make money not the issue for any of our students who want to come here. The other interesting fact I learned um, from Peggy is that you know, engineering has more than its share of Schreier students, right? Because the Schreier process is blind to gender, blind to race, blind to interest in terms of major. So 22% of the engineering students are female, but of the engineering students in the Schreier Honors College, women are at 40%, right? So the female students we get are outstanding and we need to get more of them. That's quite simply the answer. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, Jennifer's about to start a five-year cohort study of all of the factors that go into admissions that pre may predict success, right? Because the goal of admissions should be simply to accept the students with the highest probability of success. Now, other places have done similar studies and they consistently find a strong bias against women in the admission process, right? SATs are known to be, have a, a strong gender bias. So if she shows that the most qualified female applicant not admitted was more likely to succeed than the least qualified male that was admitted, then we talk to admissions about how we adjust our admissions. Now, that, that decision will be numbers driven, right? It will come out of an in-depth cohort study. It won't be haphazard, but we need to make sure that our admissions process is truly fair. And I will say one thing she discovered is that even right now, of all the women that apply to engineering at Penn State, over 70% are actually admitted. We're getting very strong female applicants, and I think we can do even better. Um, we've started the process of recruiting a new associate dean for equity and inclusion, right? So Amy Freeman was assistant dean, um, and we're elevating that position to associate dean um, and expanding its, its impact from not just the a primary focus on undergraduate programs, but on all aspects of the college. Um, an increase in scholarships, right? I don't have to say a whole a lot about that from the tactical perspective, but it is essential for increasing our, our diversity in engineering. Um, and we're going to start a distinguished lecture series. Um, it will be called the Distinguished Lecture Series on Engineering Humanity. But just as engineering is the translation of known science to practice for human betterment, right? There is a world of known science in social science on issues related to diversity, inclusion, and climate. So I'm happy to announce that our first speaker, um, the inaugural Distinguished Lecturer on Engineering Humanity, will be Dr. Claude Steele, um, former provost at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, he is a professor of psychology. He's the author of uh, Whistling Vivaldi. Um, and he was, he was recommended to me both by experts in, in academic diversity from off campus uh, and from people in campus. In fact, when I talked about wanting to do this, you know, the next day, Wayne Gersey didn't just come by and say, oh, you should look at Claude Steele. He actually left me a copy of his book. So, so Wayne really put his money where his mouth was on this one. It's a good book. I'm reading it now. Um, he is known as the really defining the phrase stereotype threat. So he will be here April 20th. Uh, it'll be in Eisenhower Auditorium. I hope you all mark your calendar now. We have at least three or four other colleges already wanting to co-sponsor. Um, so even though our, the hall is 2,500 people, um, I'm hoping that we can come close to fill it. And he's going to, this will be, I think, at 11 a.m. He's going to then spend the afternoon with us, spend some time with student groups, uh, and then some time with, with college leadership to, to talk about how to improve our climate. And the message, I, when I spoke to him about this, I told him, if after his lecture we understand the social science of diversity, inclusion, and climate better, but don't know what to do, then his talk was not a success. I said, this is targeting an engineering audience. We want to know how to implement the science and do something with it. And so he's been, and he said, this is actually what he's working on now, is how do you take what you know and, and, and functionalize it and apply it in a way that can have real impact. So I'm looking forward um, to, to hear what he has to say. The last topic, everybody's favorite, buildings and infrastructure. Um, this is key for recruiting, retention, success, aesthetics, photographs, you name it, it's important. Um, Frankly, we're at least a decade behind our competition. If you look at the um, 
scale of the college in terms of number of students, research dollars, and compare that to the percentage of, of Penn State dollars that went to building an infrastructure in the last three five-year periods, the numbers are not the same order of magnitude, quite simply. So we are, a ten, we are a decade behind. We occupy 37 buildings. I think one department alone is in 14, um, which is, is a huge challenge. And just for a comparison, you know, with only one exception, I just left NC State, where the oldest engineering building is four years younger than our newest engineering building. And this, so my office, if you're curious, was right here looking out. I watched this building go up. I watched this building go up. My lab was down here, and I watched this building go up all in a three-year period my first three years there. And this empty plot of land is where they're gonna break ground probably next year to move the last bits of the college to this campus. So we are behind. We all know that. So the goal, we're currently about 720 or 735,000 assignable square feet. I know you'll, that, that has a lot of meaning. Um, you can think about that as about a, you know, a thousand or so houses like we all have. Um, we need to get to a million square feet of assignable space. And that's the number I've put forward um, to the provost and OPP. That's the, that's the framework of the conversation right now. Um, we need to have 21st century teaching infrastructure. We need versatile spaces to evolve our student opportunities. Um, you know, I'd like to see the student makerspace um, become the world premier student makerspace for any college of engineering. Um, and it would be great if design studios were next to it. Um, and we need function-driven collaborative research spaces. And that's, that's the way we're going to think about space in the future is, is how do we design it for what we're going to do with it um, more than simply which disciplines are going to occupy it. Tactics, we have, we have started an engineering campus master plan. Um, so the provost agreed to fund this. Um, I found actually at a meeting with a, with a number of us, he's agreed to fund it. And then the next day he you know, commented to OPP, you have the money for it, right? Um, but it has started. Um, they've been asking Clark for, for the beginning input. Um, and you know, this really came out of them asking me, you know, well, what do you want to put in new buildings on West Campus? And I said, I can't answer what goes in new buildings unless I know the whole plan. Right? We have to have a plan that addresses all of our needs so then we can, we can put the chronology of how we meet those needs over time. We do expect to move forward with, with one or two new buildings on West Campus in the next few years. And I say one or two because whether it's one really big one or two depends on where they decide to put the roads. Um, they're already moving, even as we start the master planning process, um, they're starting the process um, to put in a new parking deck at the end of West Campus. They have to put the parking deck in first because our new buildings are going where the parking lots currently are. Um, I'm thankful they thought of that sequence, um, as is everybody over there. Um, but that is, you know, it's, it's not quote unquote official, but you know, the, the message is that um, so this is year five, next year is year one. There are two building renovations that will start in year one that are not engineering. Um, and then during that year one is when we'll go into the, the more detailed uh, design phase for our new buildings on West Campus. And then they would probably break ground the second year, the year after that. So that's uh, a positive step. There's also pretty high up on the list for the next five years, um, a gut and renovation of Sackett. And so <clears throat> there is progress, but the master plan really for me um, is the long-term key. There's a lot of discussion about designing the buildings more smartly so that you get a higher percentage of the gross space as, as assignable. Um, and there's discussion of, of you know, trying to pursue uh, a zero energy concept. Whether we can get there fully is debatable, right? But there's gonna be a focus on not just building a building the old way, but looking at doing it uh, in a new way. <clears throat> so last one, let me just say a few words about um, who we are and what, every, what I perceive everybody's role to be. Um, in the sake of time and hunger, I won't go through each bulleted item, um, but I think the faculty, the staff, and the students all have critical roles working together um, to move the college where we want to go in the future. Right? And you'll see in many of these cases, right, continued excellence is a recurring theme. Um, World-leading research and innovation for the faculty, but at the same time, innovative thinking for the staff. Um, being collegial and inclusive is on everybody's to-do list. Um, and I'd like to see us focus in our day-to-day -day lives on, on thinking about um, not just getting done what we need to get done and interacting with each other, um, but recognizing that we are all in the same boat. We're all trying to achieve the same ultimate goal. And we'll, we'll do it in a, in a more productive way um, if we think about collegiality. Um, for the faculty, um, in particular, visibility is important. 
If you don't want to become visible on your own, Dana will help you do it. Um, but since you're all doing great things that are going to change the world, we need to make sure everybody out there knows about it. So visibility means service in your professional societies. It means recognizing that the person in the next office should be nominated for an award and taking the initiative to do it at the faculty level, at the department level, and at the college level. We need to make each other visible. Most of us don't like to go and talk about what we did, but we can certainly go out and talk about what the person in the next office did and do that for each other. Um, you know, in the spirit of Michelangelo, we all have to aim for the highest goals. So when I meet with the, you know, the, the junior faculty wanting to learn about promotion and tenure, the message is, and it's the same message I give the faculty candidates that are starting to come through, I don't want you worrying about promotion and tenure to associate. I want you planning your career for getting into the National Academy. Right? The trajectory at Penn State for faculty should be assistant, associate, full, distinguished, endowed academy, and then beyond. Now, I know the numbers. The, the probability of everybody we hire getting to the National Academy is, of course, small because of all the, the, all the variety of things that go into it, but that's not the point. The point is that's where we aim, and if you aim for the highest goal, right, those other steps along the way will essentially take care of themselves. You know, I want, another thing you'll see everywhere on, on all these columns is to mentor formally and informally and to be mentorable. We all can learn from each other. That's not just a comment within columns, but across columns, right? We learn from those that are younger than us as well as those who are more experienced than us. And we need to be open um, to learning from everybody else's experiences in life. Um, I have a separate column. You are wondering why is it faculty, staff, and students, not the leadership team that got their own column. Um, this graphic actually got added this morning. I met uh, one of our um, alums who talked for 30 minutes about fishing and 10 minutes about leadership. Um, it's good to be retired, I guess. Um, but he pointed to this diamond, and the idea here is that you know, when leadership operates with these four attributes, then the middle section is, is filled in with the idea of greatness. Um, so to the leadership team, you know, thoughtful leadership I think we have. Um, I will be pushing more and more on the collaborative spirit, tearing down walls, working together across departments, across disciplines, and across campus. Um, think about new approaches. Leadership has to, if we want a, a more collegial and diverse and inclusive climate, it has to start with leadership, and so I'll be looking for that from, from everyone. Sharing best practices can be done at every level, um, from, the, from you know, the newest hourly staff through department heads and deans. Um, innovate, you know, another factor that I should have mentioned on the previous page that's on every column is instilling a safety culture, right? Safety is, ex you know, safety is extremely important. We don't talk about it. Um, perhaps as much as we should. The places that have had dire accidents, I'm telling you, they wish they had talked about it more before the accident. And so, um, you know, if you're walking down the hall and you see somebody else's lab and you see students in there without safety goggles on or other safety, um, following, not following the optimum safety procedures, everyone has the right responsibility to say something. It doesn't matter who you are, what your position is, um, we all look out for each other and remind each other of, of safety. Um, mentoring and being mentorable. So with that, I will leave you with um, one of my favorite quotes from September 1962, one of the most impactful quotes in the history of American engineering by a politician at that, who didn't realize he was having impact on engineering. Um, but I know a large number of the people that went into science and engineering in my father's generation did so because we went to the moon, right? And these were the words that, some of the words that Kennedy spoke at Rice University when he announced the, the plan to reach the moon by the end of the decade, right? We, chose, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because the challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one that we're willing to postpone, and one which we intend to win. And I will not do that with a Boston accent. Um, but, but those were Kennedy's words that, that sent us to the moon, and I will note we got there in less than seven years. I think every goal that we've set forward today, we can reach within less than seven years. Because if we can go from the Earth to the moon in that time, we can do these things. So with that, thank you for <clears throat> listening. I know there's probably a stream. Probably one of the questions is, why is he going so long? Um, <laughs> so I'll be happy to take uh, questions from the floor and from, from the internet. Thank you.
many departments. We have never had any members of National Academy of Engineers, so I'm quite encouraged by your uh, mm -hmm. you know, mentioning that we have to do that. But we also have to know that or find out why, why is it so, uh, right? In terms of funding, for example, I talk about mechanical engineers. We are, actually, we are as good as MIT, even higher than MIT. Mm -hmm. So let me answer, so first on the National Academy, I would say when I got here, people asked me, what was the, what surprised me the most about Penn State when I got here? So I think there were three things, one Ken's heard of. The first thing that shocked me was I learned that engineering doesn't have a box at the football stadium. Um, <laughs> and with, with 95,000 living alums, I think we need one, we're working on that. The second two were the fact that there were less NAE members in the college than there were in my department at NC State. And the third is the lack of ERC as a leadership. I knew we'd been part of them, but the fact that we hadn't led them. So the NAE is a tricky business, right? It's a, if there was ever a rich get rich system, it's the NAE. And in recent years, they've put more and more focus on trying to get members out of industry, which means the reduced number of university academic slots gets eaten even more quickly by the places that you know, that have so many members that they keep reproducing themselves. Um, the alum I talked to today is actually a member of the NAE. And of course, as you know, if you know NAE members, they're very um, protective of their process, right? I mean, they, they own the process and they take that seriously. So I did speak to this alum today um, and asked him if he, because he brought it up too. He actually brought it up before I did. Um, and I asked him if he could take leadership and we may not have a network of NAE members on faculty. We do have a network of, we have the ability to build a network of NAE members from our alums. So I've asked him to start putting that network together and see if this is something that he can help us address. Please, this is a conversation. Impact. It's not necessary if you have dollars. Right. Let's talk about the impact we have with it. Dollars are a mechanism to achieve an end. Right. And by end, I don't mean increased FNA. Right. I mean research impact and results. So when I see our citation score high, I'm encouraged. When I talk about faculty and I say be visible and nominate each other for awards, you know, one of the things that this alum talked about was, you know, if you're going to be the, the pieces you need to do to be an NAE, considered for NAE, right, you have to have the, the significant impact. We know that, right? You also have to have significant visibility, right? Most NAE members, their election to the NAE is not the first award they've received externally, right? They're usually fellow of one or more societies. They've received all the major awards in their societies. 
All of those things we can do now, right? And we need to work together to do that across the board in every department to promote all of our faculty. I had a faculty member back at, at NC State who was, you know, the most, um, most likely to complain to me about his fellow faculty, right, for all sorts of reasons. The minute he left campus, he was also the most likely to nominate his colleagues for awards, right? And we, can, we should be doing that for each other as frequently as possible. Um, we have to have the visibility. We have to be participating you know, in national leadership forums in our discipline. So all of those things go together. The, the nomination and selection, you know, when you're ready for that, there's definitely a roll of the dice aspect to it. There's no doubt. But if you don't do the things to get ready for it, there's nothing we can do. What was the second topic you brought up was? Ah, well, yes, right. So I think that goes hand in hand, right, is, is having that broad-based visibility by working with, with others. I have one question. Meeting minutes from the unit executive committee appear on the committee blog and they were interesting to read. The minutes have not been posted since May. Will the meeting minutes be posted in the future? So the current thinking is no because um, there are times at those meetings that we talk about things that need to be kept private. Um, sometimes individual HR matters may come up um, or other topics that are simply um, need to be protected. And once something is you know, available on, a, on an internet or on a blog for a moment, it's there forever. Um, if there's enough request, we could probably do um, a filtered version um, and, and put that out with Synopsys. This is actually the first, uh, first I know of anybody asking about it. Um, I don't know if we have record of, of hits on the blog previously. Um, but we're certainly open to, you know, to putting out whatever information can be publicly disclosed, put it that way. Um, many of the other online questions have been somewhat addressed by your presentation, but in the interest of um, being fair, I'm going to ask them anyway. Sure. Uh, the results of the College of Engineering Engaged Climate Survey were released last September. How are the results of the survey being used to improve the College of Engineering climate? So I talked about a partial answer to that already and some of the things we've started doing. Um, the other thing is, is Tom has come to, to Anthony and I and we've started looking um, more deeply at, at the results again and we're honestly we're coming trying to come up with strategies and tactics to address to address more aspects and you know if people want to send in suggestions either anonymously or or face to face we're open to it um, there's no lack of commitment to address all of the issues that I can say categorically it, it's a question of finding the, the best ways to do it and um, Tom calls himself now a, a what was it, a well a well-intentioned almost expert amateur. He called well-intentioned amateur. I think he's actually uh, developing some very strong expertise there, and um, just showing his humility with that name. Um, so we're looking for, for for ways that we can do that. In you know, it was a wide variety of topics in the survey, and so it's going to require a, a significant variety of responses. And people will probably take it too. Yes. Right. So the, the search for the new associate dean um, is about to go public. Um, Whit Kiefer is a, a national um, headhunting recruitment firm. Um, they're coming tomorrow morning actually to start engaging with us to do the deeper dive in terms of Q&A and, and how we want that position to be structured, what we want it to accomplish. Um, I think we already have two strong applicants, even though we haven't announced the position yet. So I'm confident that we'll, um, we'll get someone who can really help us be transformative. So the collaboratory disappeared somewhere between my first and second interview. I don't know exactly. There was, it was all the rage the first time I talked and the second time I came, nobody talked about it. And I asked and they said, no, that's gone already. Um, so the collaboratory ran, I think, into problems because of two factors. One, it was situated right over here in principle, and we're in the Alumni Center, and the Alumni Center also wants to grow in that direction. Um, so I think we kind of ran into to maybe a physical footprint issue. Um, I think there may have been a parking issue with that location also. Um, dropping a big building in the undersized parking lot that's already there was probably not the best plan. Um, and frankly, the other big issue it ran into was um, President Barron saying, oh my god, Hammond is still here. Um, <laughs> 
And uh, that, that sort of, I think that shifted some of the priorities. Um, but I will say this, my message to, to OPP was, you can call it a collaboratory, you can call it a West Campus building, you can call it anything you want. We need spaces that are higher quality, larger in square footage, and allow us to, to condense our, both more footage, but, but also integrate what we do more. And so all of the themes of the collaboratory are certainly still um, front and center in our thinking about new infrastructure. It's just not going to be that building in that location. So first, let me say, I'm impressed by anyone who has the data going back 24 years. And if you have that data to share, it would be great to have it to see um, where the drops were. So, I mean, the U.S. News & World Report is the rankings that we all love to hate, but we all look at because it's the one that most people look at. Um, is it, it's important in some ways. It's important in the fact that undergraduates look at it, but, and both domestic and, even more importantly, abroad. And so um, it's one of the things that influences whether they apply and where they apply. And if you've been in a department that's crossed the 20 threshold going in either direction, you've seen a significant change in your graduate applications most likely because there are clear, clear demarcation points where people make their decision to apply or not. So from that perspective, um, as flawed as that metric is, we do look at it. Um, we don't, you know, the parallel of teaching to the test and doing things simply for the rankings, I think if we do all the right things um, and, and, and put our resources and time and effort into the right things, and get a handle on the student ratio and the student faculty ratio, we'll see that ranking return. That's it. Great. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, thank you so much for staying and for your attention and for everything that you do for the college day in and day out um, to make this place as great a place as it is. And I look forward to working with all of you. And now, please enjoy. <laughs>